everyone. Thank you for joining us today at the Polaritron Chemistry Webinar Series. I am Sindhana and I am a graduate student at UC San Diego in the UNJAO Research Group. I am honored to host today's speaker, Professor Gino George from Aysen Mohali. Before we begin with the speaker's talk, I would like to share some information about the schedule and mechanics of the webinar. Um, so this is the upcoming schedule. Um, as you may know, the Polariton Chemistry webinar takes place every Wednesday at 9 a.m. Pacific time, and you need to register for this at this link. And if you haven't signed up already, we have a Facebook group called the Polariton Chemistry Online Community. Um, you can post about papers, conferences, job postings, and more related to Polariton Chemistry on this page. We also have a YouTube channel where we post the recordings of these webinars. So if you ever want to watch them again, you can watch them on YouTube. Now on to the mechanics of the webinar. During the talk, you can use the raise hand button to ask questions. Once you click on the raise hand button, I will notify the speaker and you can ask your question. Um, you can also use the chat to start discussions with other participants and you can post written questions in the Q&A. Without further delay, let me introduce today's speaker. Professor Gino George received his PhD on chiral plasmonics from CSIR NIST Tiruvannamalapuram. Later, he had a postdoctoral stint at ISIS University of Strasbourg in the group of Professor Th Thomas Edison. There, he studied the effect of strong light matter interaction on chemical and physical properties of coupled molecules and materials. He has been a faculty member in the Department of Chemical Sciences at Aizen Mohali since 2017. And there his studies are focused on understanding the properties of hybrid light matter states and its application in controlling chemical reaction rates. He's also interested in, the, in studying the transport behavior of electromagnetically dressed 2D materials like graphene and TMDs. With that being said, I pass the microphone and screen to Professor Gino George. All right, thank you, uh, Sintana, for your nice words of introduction. Uh, let me share my screen. I think it's visible. Let me. All right. Yeah, I would like to thank uh, the organizers, especially Dr. Joel and uh, Dr. Siang for, for giving me an opportunity to present our work in this uh, uh, this conference series, the Polariton Chemistry Webinar Series. And this is the second time I, uh, from the last round table discussion. Uh, I am back again uh, with, an, with, a, with a topic which is basically of interest for us for, for, for almost three years uh, in Aizam Hali. Uh, the title of the talk is uh, Controlling a Chemical Reaction uh, through cooperative vibration strong coupling. Okay, so I will uh, very briefly I, I explain this part in the beginning in the roundtable discussion also, where we got the motivation. So uh, this idea of coherent chemistry. I assume that the, uh, the audience is uh, very well aware about strong coupling, and uh, its consequences and one of hybrid states and so forth. So I straight away go to the the, uh, the, uh, the introduction of where we basically got this idea of uh, coherent uh, controlling chemical reactions uh, using Wacom field coupling. So uh, long back in 2012, uh, we, uh, when I joined the group of uh, Thomas Everson, uh, so we, we tried to came across, we came up with this paper along with Dr. Uh, James Hutchison, now currently he's in Australia. Uh, so we came across this paper, a softening of hydrogen H2 plus molecular being in dense laser field. Uh, so we, we found that when, when we use very high power, roughly around uh, 50 terawatts of power uh, of laser field, we can able to break the bond of, of a given reaction, uh, given H2 plus molecule, and you pump energy into this bond, and you see the bond softening happens very beautifully. Then we found this paper as well, this two particular, this very interesting reaction, a molecule, ethylene, a reactive fluorine, form an adduct CFH2, CFH2 molecule. This is done by long back in 1983 by George Pimental and group. We can see he is a famous for matrix uh, isolation techniques. 
So he used nitrogen matrix uh, specifically to trap this molecule and study the reactions so at four Kelvin or, or in this range of temperature in which argon or nitrogen will be used as a matrix. So you can see here in this experiment, very selectively, they try to uh, excite uh, the vibrational state because he is also famous for, for lasers, IR infrared lasers. They have state of art facility for, for creating infrared lasers for selective excitations of vibrational bands of many molecules. So for this particular reaction, CH2 gives, uh, uh, in the presence of fluorine, that gives CH2F, CH2F, this molecule, this reaction, they try to couple, very interestingly, this band, V11, which is here, you can see here, this is, uh, you can see this is uh, CH asymmetric stretch, this two, literally, getting affected very strongly, as you can see here, this is a quantum yield of the reaction versus time in hours. So. Okay, and it's progress in hours. So you can see here by progressing time, they selectively excite these two bonds. And then you see the, the quantum yield of the reaction increased. And even the combinations of that also been affecting. And this paper is an interesting paper for us to start with. Uh, from this, uh, we try to compare uh, this also, how coherent chemistry or laser controlled chemistry uh, versus strong coupling. I will come to the aspects once again. So in the paper, the first one I mentioned that the PRL paper, they use very high intense laser, which is in the form of terawatts of power. The light field approach, the internuclear binding energy, binding field of molecule and the molecule potential deformed because the electron move very fast and the nucleus is cannot able to cope with that, then the bond softening occurs in that case. Whereas in our experiment, we use low intensity, almost zero photon, or we call virtual photon. Uh, the molecule is strongly coupled with the cavity vacuum field and then do the reaction. So this is uh, fascinating at the time. And we thought of a science fiction in the beginning that it might not be working, but uh, then uh, the progress of the reaction I'll come across. And if you're interested, I'll also re uh, request to read uh, Professor Richard Sir, I've written an article about 1998 about laser control reaction and its implications, how site selectivity, mode selectivity can be controlled by laser coupling. And this is another review, a uh, very recent one written by Professor Abbasen related to this uh, strong coupling chemistry topic. So uh, the first experiment, uh, when I was joined in this lab that I noticed this particular reaction, a, spy, a molecule called spiroparan, this celebrated molecule, Spiroperan is colorless uh, at this particular form, okay? When you irradiate with UV, UV light here, specifically at 330 nanometer, uh, you will be able to form merosinin, this conjugated ring structure. This become colored and shows an intense absorption at 560 nanometer, okay? This is how it is. So we place this molecule in a fabri perot cavity configuration fabric or cavity configuration. As you can see here, this will be silver mirror. This will be silver mirror here. And then you have a coating, a polymer coating on either side. And then this is your uh, spiropyran molecule in the center. You irradiate with UV light, 330. The reason which we irradiate 330 because this is the so-called isobestic point in which the spiropyran merosin coexist their extension coefficient or absorption won't change. So, uh, so absorption won't change, so the optical effects are much minimum uh, at isobestic point. So that is a specific reason we excite there. And then you can see that when you radiate, you, you keep the cavity, fabric or fabric or cavity exactly at this position. And by time progressing, what happened is that uh, more and more merosanin molecule formed and merosanin forms uh, interact with the cavity, fo cavity photon to create the P plus and the P minus state very specifically. This splitting energy goes up to roughly 700 milliliter volt, okay? Uh, not splitting energy here. So the fun thing we notice that normally this reaction in solution phase, they, they follow first order reaction. This is a first, pseudo first order reaction. Even though it's a complicated mechanism, I will come to that in, in next slide very quickly. Uh, so we took this molecule uh, in uh, in a 
PMMA matrix. It's a polymethyl metacrylate, metacrylate matrix. And uh, you can see here that it still follows first order rate. The moment merosanin forms, it get coupled to the cavity. And you can see that the reaction tried to deviate from first order and you see that slowly getting slowed down. As you can see it progress and the reaction gets slower and slower by increasing the strength of the coupling. So this is really fascinating. Uh, so you can see here for a bare molecule itself, I was just telling you the, the, the reaction mechanism is complicated or the reaction kinetics is complicated. As you see, the spiroparent molecule has to get excited into a space a star, that excited state that follows a rate K1, this is a fast process, then it come back to an intermediate, intermediate include a complexation other process. I am not going to discuss these details are given in the paper. This intermediate again, undergo, pass through the conical intersection and come back to merosinin. So you have a competing process. Many of them are competing processes. You have a thermal return pathway also here, as you can see, K1T and K inverse T. These all play together. Eventually what happens is your K observed is somehow zero first order, which is actually equivalent of K of forward and K backward together. The detailed equations are given in the paper. So I give you ready reference, you can look into it. So what happens that when under strong coupling, you create polariton minus state as shown here. This polariton minus state somehow reshuffle the energy landscape. And for example, in the paper, they clearly mentioned that photosessionary state, that means the, the degree or the percentage in which the merosan is formed initially was 80%. It's dropped by 70% and K forward by K backward now decreased and strong coupling modify not only the reaction curve and also a photostationary state of the reaction. Clearly in this experiment just shown in 2012, done in 2012. One interesting aspect of this paper is still uh, we are trying to understand or in the paper itself it is mentioned that this pathway which is the thermal pathway Okay, is also possible that the reaction when it, when it's in merosanin form, it can come back to the spheroparin form. You can see here we have written uh, the the energy levels of both the, the systems slightly different, as you can see here. Under strong coupling, this this ground state zero will push a little bit down, as we have shown again in the thermodynamics paper, that this can also even control the chemical reaction we thought, but actually due to very bad noise that and not able to detect properly. And this is again trigger further discussion in, in our group during the time uh, to see that whether you can control a ground state reaction. This is basically the idea of vibrational strong coupling come into our mind. So uh, along with Dr. Atef Shalapni, we tried uh, some fundamental understanding, tried to do some fundamental works on trying to couple a polymer molecule. Here it is polyvinyl acetate. Uh, is, um, we have a question. Yeah, please. Um, what? Hi, you know, uh, can I can I ask you uh, in the previous slide? Yeah. You guys ever consider um, coupling just the reactant, uh, coupling the reactant transition instead of the product transition, and in that case, do you guys see any changes? Right, so this is actually electronic strong coupling. Normally, spiropyran is colorless. That means this transition type of moment is almost very weak, extremely weak. Okay. So we cannot able to couple the electronic state of spiropyran. That's the reason we couple marosanin. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Right here, so polyvinyl acetate uh, is a molecule which is used actually it's a very long polymer. It's just roughly around 105 kilo Dalton, a very long molecular weight. This molecule is used, it has many carbonyl groups. So these carbonyl groups has very strong oscillator strength, infrared vibration. As you can see here, we are now coupling V0, V1. Instead of the electronic state, this is the vibration state. And the only difference is actually this FP cavity. This FP cavity, the effective path length changes drastically here. Previously it was 100, 120 nanometer. Now this becomes six micrometer uh, to 24 roughly around. This is the working range we are working in our lab. Uh, uh, so this is a large gap and you place this molecule uh, between these mirrors and you move one of the mirror very precisely. 
this is what it does. And you see the very nice low reaction shape of a carbonyl stretching mode of polyvinyl acetate. You can couple the band. And uh, this is now we can, we, we, we are sure that we can able to couple a vibration state. Now our idea was to just do a chemical reaction using uh, this concept. So Dr. Anub, uh, so we tried many molecules. At the end, Dr. Anub came up with this particular, uh, particular molecule. Uh, it's called PTA. This is phenylacetylene trimethylsilane derivatives. It's per, it is protected. Phenylacetylene is protected by a trimethylsilane group. And you can see there is a carbon silicon bond. Uh, this bond will be very, uh, you know, it can be cleaved. This is a protecting group for phenylacetylene. This can be cleaved in the presence of treasury butyl uh, T buff. This, this is a very mild base in presence of methanol. The fluoride ion go and attack on the on the silicon center form a pentavalent state and bone breaking occurs and you form this product. This is what happens. So you can see here a clear uh, band. This has as a contribution, a percentage contribution of uh, carbon silicon bond clearly. And this band is getting coupled to one of the cavity modes. As you can see here, P plus and P minus. So once you couple it, we try to follow their kinetics here. So now the previous geometry was just showing you that was actually a fabric borrowed cavity for a solid state configuration. This we designed in the lab. Now we can see that we can able to have reactants injected into the cell and you have gold on either side and these are zinc selenate substrates, okay? Zinc selenate substrates are robust. They, they are literally uh, transparent in the entire IR region. I can able to monitor them very clearly by using IR spectroscopy. Okay, this is the whole idea. So this is a micro infrared microfluidic flow cell cavity. So you inject the reactant into the cell, then we try to follow by using FTIR. So the, the interesting fact is here, this phenyl acetylene, which is formed as a product from this molecule, T PTA, okay, is clearly uh, shows a difference in the refractive index. Then we try to look into delta FSR, this is controlling uh, the refractive this variation control the delta FSR. Since it's a pseudo first order reaction, any change in the window, we can able to monitor. And we clearly see that uh, the change uh, LN delta FSR shows a very clear variation. You can see it's a beautiful linear regression freak with respect to time. At on resonance condition, we slow down the reaction roughly around four times. Okay, clearly four times. You can see that off resonance as well as outside the cavity, they match almost similar. And then we took the product out. We took the product out. We did just chromatography, coupled MS. And we found that at own resonance condition, this product is formed in very less amount, whereas outside they are forming in abundant. So this is again proved and clearly we show, uh, we, we, we could able to understand, we could clearly see that strong coupling does stop the process, but we didn't stop there. Uh, we went further. We went further and tried to prepare a molecule. This molecule was prepared by Dr. Joseph Moran and his group. Uh, we can see that this has two functional groups, silicon carbide, uh, sorry, uh, silicon oxygen and carbon silicon here. So there are two functional group. The idea was to prepare this molecule in which they cleave in into two way, one product one and product two. Idea was to make it 50-50, uh, but uh, actually in reality, they, they, they basically uh, form the product of 50%, instead of 50%, this form 60% and this form 40% in non-cavity condition, okay? This is how, uh, in, in, this in, the, in the particular reactant conditions. So then we try to couple, the idea is to selectively couple a vibrational band and observe the reaction rate very clearly to observe the reaction rate. So here, silicon oxygen band is coupled, carbon silicon band is also coupled separately to try to understand the reaction. So you can see here, we did a kinetic action spectra. That means you have a mirror, you have a mirror, you will have other mirror. You move this mirror very precisely to get your FSR changing. So you see, you see that you're more over here, you're more over here, more over here, coupled in such a way that you come exactly over here you see the reaction now, it was going with a rate of 9 into 10 power, 10 power minus 3, dropped to roughly around 2 into 10 minus, uh, 10 minus 3. 
four, four to four point five times change in the rate. Exactly, this is the where place where you have carbon silicon bond. Okay, then we came here. This particular region is you have oxygen silicon bond. Okay, then we see here this is silicon carbon with the uh, with the hydrogen atom. So this is actually spectator methyl group which is sitting over there. It's bending mode straight away. Uh, sir, so uh, we yeah. have a question in the chat. Um, yeah, please. So the question says, uh, but if the transitional dipole moment of spiropyrin is too small, why is the reaction happening at all? Could it be that it was difficult to create a metal clad cavity resonant at 330? Oh, really? Yeah, I got the point. So yeah, so the, the, the spiropyrin they absorb, actually, I was telling you there is isobestic point, 330 nanometer. 330 nanometer, I don't have a cavity mode. So it's very hard to get even a cavity mode on that frequency to see the forward reaction. So uh, even the transition dipole moment is, moment is there that you can convert, you can photo excite the spiral parent from ground to excite state. Okay, I have not shown the molecule, that's where the question comes. So spiral parent has actually a weak band at 330. Uh, that band is getting excited and you go to excited state, then you go undergo the chronicle intersection and coming back to the marrow sign. This is what is happening. But getting a cavity in that configuration is quite hard because silver is already having bulk absorption uh, close below 400. So you will get a completely dissipated cavity mode. And you know, it's almost reflectionless, it absorb a lot. So you will not able to form a cavity in that regime. So I hope that answers the question. Of course, we can able to do this if you use other kind of mirrors, but maybe our understanding, uh, maybe you have to try the forward reaction. Forward reaction again here, uh, is a bit difficult because the transition dipole moment is still weaker for spiroparent. Barosanin has a very high transition dipole moment. I hope this answers the doubt. Of, yeah, I hope. thank you. Right? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So now you can see here, uh, what I explained is the action spectra, kinetic action spectra. Now I will show you reaction yield, which is shown here is very clearly that I was telling you that off resonance condition, we get 60 percentage of product one quantum yield and 40 percent for right product two. This is where we started with. Now you couple on resonance silicon carbon. This is actually silicon methyl group. This is CSACH3. This is we call spectral bond. All of a sudden, you the, the, the rate code inverted. This become roughly 20, 25 percent, if I'm correct, roughly. And then you see when you couple on resonance and silicon oxygen, you see that what happened is quantum yield of the two basically jumped up as you can see here. In all these cases, quantum yield of the two jumped up to roughly 80%, they slowly vary. Of course, I hope that it's come within the condition. So that means literally coupling silicon oxygen, you speed up the process, whereas coupling carbon silicon, you slow down the process. All these cases is slowing down, one taking over. This is a paper uh, last year published by Besson Group uh, that you can selectively couple vibrational bands and see the control, you can control the uh, reaction rate. Okay, now I come back to what we are doing in ICER. So I, I will show you two examples uh, that basically have come to cooperativity experiments. So this is a fabric product cavity, a simple geometry that I was showing. This is the one we are using in our lab. So we have very clearly, we use barium fluoride here, barium fluoride windows. These windows are being uh, advantage that you can have, it is, it is transparent from UV to up, UV visible up to infrared. So it is starting from 2.2 micrometer all the way up to 12 micrometer. It is transparent. Okay, so barium fluoride windows open a new way of measuring instead of infrared uh, uh, FTAR technique, you can use a visible technique uh, to probe a reaction by coupling a vibration state. That's why we use barium fluoride here. And you can see here, gold mirrors are coated, and then it's a separate, you have actually a thin layer of silicon dioxide, which is a protecting layer we call inactive layer, which basically stop uh, stopping the reacting medium to interact with the gold. And then we have a Mylar spacer, which basically control the distance between. And this mirror is mobile. I call M1, and this is M2. And M2 is fixed, and M1 will be mobile, as you can see here. Here, okay, this is how it's look like. And here, the modes which is formed, for example, this is actually a prototype. I can just, just show you. This is FSR, free spectral range of 240. That means your lambda by two comes around 240 numbers. 
And this is the fifth mode, sixth mode, they go progressively. This is a linear scale. As you can see, this distance is 240 centimeter intervals. All right, so we will have Q roughly here. Q will be roughly around 60 to 100. Okay, this is how our quality factors roughly. And this will get coupled to vibration, which is matching. Okay, that we tune and then couple one of the mode. So I will now jump into this pro, uh, this my my area where I was really working interested in uh, cooperative vibration strong coupling at least for the today's discussion. So so far we tried to couple the two experiments I have shown uh, basically on desalination experiments is directly coupling the molecule in excess. That means you do a neat reaction literally taking excess high concentration roughly 10 power 10 molecules reacting in the medium. Now what we will be doing is a trick here that we will try to use the concept of cooperativity principle. You take this molecule, this is a reactant now. This is called paranitro, P-N-P-A, paranitrophenyl acetate. This molecule, same tip of a mild base in ethyl acetate. As you can see, ethyl acetate has a band 1752 centimeter inverse. PNPA is roughly around 1756 centimeter inverse, if I'm correct. So they have almost overlapping bands. So what I do is I take ethyl acetate 1000 times, whereas PNPA substrate only one. So I can take substrate in low concentration. I take solvent in excess. I couple literally the solvent. This is 10% ethyl acetate. You create P plus and P minus band here. As you can see here, clearly you get a two polariton state coming out. So if you take 100%, I'll get splitting energy roughly in the range of 100, 180, 190 centimeter inverse for this particular experiment. So that's strong enough that I can reach ultra strong coupling. Okay. So very interestingly, my student, uh, Jodi Lather, when she was doing this experiment, we found that the moment you tune the cavity to own resonance conditions, you see that absorbance PNPA when react forms paranitrophenoxide, it absorbs at 400 nanometer. Okay, that's actually a coloring. Most of the time is used in uh, this uh, conjugated species, so it shows a beautiful color around 400 nanometer, and it's full of fewer first order reaction here. So we see almost one order increase in the rate by tuning the cavity to own resonance condition. So you can see here it's follow first order beautifully here and almost sometimes we have seen up to 15 times change exactly a tuning. I will show that in, in a minute here. This is the kinetic action spectra. So we basically tune the cavity mode here from this FSR all the way and crossing the band here as you can see here, crossing the band. The moment it overlap exactly with the carbonyl band of the ethyl acetate as well as the molecule, you see an enhancement roughly 10 to 15 times. Then you move away, you see that it's dropping. This is clear indication. So selectively, we can couple and you see that we can able to control the reaction very precisely through this tuning effect. Okay, then we tried isotope experiment. What we did is just replace carbon 12 of ethyl acetate by carbon 13. So what happened is that ethyl acetate band moved more than greater than 30 centimeter inverse away from the mole, uh, PNPA position. And then overlap almost decreased. You can see here. And then you see here that when you couple C13, we see already there is a drop in the reaction. This is also a large amount. This is beyond kinetic isotope effect. So primary kinetic isotope effect, basically you can call KC12 uh, divided by KC13. It has to be, it has a small effect, okay? It's, it's roughly around 1.1 time, but this is showing roughly four or five times, which already indicates that solvent plays a crucial role and this process are solvolysis. And, and here vibration overlap has, it's giving a reservoir kind of stuff for, for the reaction to proceed and thermal collisions are happening through the vibrational reservoir, which means that already by just changing C12, this is for C12 and this is for C13, we clearly see a drastic change in the reaction itself. and upon uh, changing or tuning the cavity for C13, we didn't see any enhancement in the reaction rate. It's also indicated that cooperative has a playing a very strong role in controlling reaction here. So very strong effect of cooperativity is proved by isotope effect. Sir, 
Professor, we have a question. Um, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Please. Sorry, and um, also j just to clarify. So when you say strong coupling, this is strong coupling at k equals zero, right? Like. Uh, yes. Yes. But then when when you see almost no no effects of the cavity, do you when you look at the spectrum, do you see uh, polariton states outside of k equals zero? All right, so what we do is actually these measurements they literally give you a line shape and the Q factor is even extracted this count. It, 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 uh, it normally, uh, what I would say that the maximum, uh, this discussion came, uh, I remember of some of the, uh, sometimes back. So we can only say the normal incidence which, com which basically dominate here. That's what I can say straight away. But do you- uh, But do you still have other angles possible, but they will be weak compared to the normal incidence. Okay, so you, 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 when you natural selection will be the normal incidence automatically, the others will be, you know, they, they basically diminish on either side. Sure, but my question is, uh, okay, but then at, outside of k equals zero, so not normal incidence, you still see polariton uh, splittings, yet you see almost no changes in kinetics. Is that is... Uh, you mean you, yeah, that's what I, I, I was trying to tell that you're asking, uh, you see that uh, what happened is once you create the geometry, once you create the geometry, it select a naturally uh, a normal incidence, which natural, uh, what do you call path length, that path length will support a normal incidence, which will show the highest, uh, what do you call uh, photon uh, field intensity, what I, I would say, automatically. But uh, what you do by external measurement, you basically change uh, the, because the photon is already been created inside. So I feel like that's already the virtual photon will have the highest photon field, if I'm correct. If I don't know if this answer, or I, I don't know your, your, your question is something else. Yeah, I, I guess the question is, uh, when you, do you ever measure the full dispersion of the polarities as a function? Dis uh, dispersion is literally, uh, I would say that you have to have your external photon falling into, right? So here, this is naturally select, like you think about a particle in a box, you already have a box defined here and the energy is defined by itself. No, I understand, but my question is, when you measure the transmission spectrum of the polaritons, do you still see splittings outside of k equals zero and are they large? And when they are large- No, 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 for, for these molecules, no, because this molecule has actually, I mean, we have seen normally the, I, I don't know whether you're asking the mold folding effect is the, the, due to large dispersion of the refractive index, but normally this is not there in this kind of molecule because their oscillator strength are so poor. No. Maybe I can ask you later about this, but I'm, I'm not sure I understand some of these statements. Okay, um, let me not interrupt this and I'll ask you later. All right, sure, sure. We can come back, definitely. Yeah, I'll be happy. I think we have one more question from Jeff Ovalitsky. Oh, sorry, wait. Uh, yeah. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah hi, Jeff. Yeah, please. Hello? Yeah. yeah, hello, I can hear you. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, please. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, sorry. Um, so I'm going to pile on. Sorry about that. I'll ask afterwards. Sorry. Yeah, maybe you can ask the question. You can type the question so since then I can read it. It will be also another way of, all right. So may I continue? Then maybe you can come back to that even the last, last round. Yeah. That's part of the discussion, yeah. Okay, so here, uh, what we did is to try to do the isotope experiment to prove that the cooperativity experiment, clearly that we see the cooperativity plays a clear role, especially even if you change uh, the molecule C12 to C13, without coupling, we see the effect. That's the reason I was telling. All right, so now kinetic versus thermodynamics, we used iron equation. Clearly from the iron equation, we found that there is a huge drop of activation enthalpy, clearly indicating that the reaction, uh, somehow the transition state is getting more polar and then getting stabilized. This is what I understood from by doing this. And we see that actually the free energy also dropping drastically in this case, roughly uh, five kilojoule per mole. 
at uh, room temperature. This indicate that there is something really happening in the transient state. We are now trying to understand what is happening in this particular class of molecules. Okay, so uh, this all wonderful experiment was completely done by 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 Jodi Lather. She she's uh, is her uh, thesis work. So you can see here that by just changing uh, the coupling strength uh, by couple by changing the concentration of ethyl acetate, we could see that there is a non-linear change uh, really happening with respect to the uh, rate of the reaction, and still it follows the Arrhenius relations and. Uh, what we have seen in the array plot. And we are now currently understanding what is really happening to the transient state of similar class of molecules. Now we are trying in some different class of derivatives of this molecule, trying to understand what is happening to the transient state specifically under this condition. Okay, this is one experiment. Another experiment, we took actually a very large molecule. This time is an enzyme. I think I have time. Yeah, I'm roughly 14 minutes. So here we use same substrate PNPA, paranitrophenyl acetate, a molecule called alpha chemotrypsin. The, the idea of using alpha chemotrypsin is actually is a beautiful molecule. This is actually three amino acid group, one, two, three. These three molecules work like a triad. This is called a catalytic triad. What that does is literally very interesting. There is a charge, which basically migrate over here and activate the carbonyl carbon here on this molecule through serenoids band. And then you basically create O minus and create a retrograde state and then this revert back. So this is called relay mechanism by proposed by Professor Bray long back in 1980s, 1980s, uh, end of 1980s, if I'm correct. There are a lot of papers related to that. So what is basically is a proton shuttle mechanism straight away that connected to hydrogen bonding relay. This is what happens here using alpha chemotrypsin. This class of molecule shows this. Okay, so what happened is that we try to use the enzyme and look into the formation of this particular pyranitrophenoxide ion using uh, PNPA as a substrate. Alpha chemotrypsin is the enzyme. The idea here is to couple solute alpha cysteine, uh, alpha chemotrypsin in water as a solvent. So we use we couple OH and NH stretching band. They are having equal energy, and we couple them to the same cavity mode and give the cooperative splitting, okay? So this is how it looks like. You have a serine molecule, uh, sorry, uh, alpha chemotrypsin large enzyme molecule, which is roughly around 25 kilo Dalton. This molecule is very large, okay? And then you have surrounded in, in buffer medium of water, literally. And you can see here that the polarity Vp plus and Vp minus formed from the inhomogeneously broad water band. And we can clearly see that uh, the polariton minus and polariton plus is formed in the large splitting we can achieve with water. Okay, then see, yeah, this is the splitting energy roughly around 700 centimeter inverse here for this water coupling. So, we uh, when Jodi was doing this experiment, she was using a concentration of ethyl acetate roughly 5 into 10 power minus 5 molar. Okay, this is very low. And the substrate concentration for this case is 0.4 millimolar in water, pure water, pure water, pure H2. Pure H2 is 55.5 molar. Okay, so you think now we have uh, E0 is 10 power 5 minus 5 molar, and this is roughly 5 into uh, 5, 55 molar. So the difference is roughly around 10 power minus 5. So we have taken uh, our uh, enzyme. 10 power 5 molar concentration, lower than that of the water, but water is coupled here. So that's the idea of cooperativity. Then we study the reaction at 400 nanometer, specifically at own resonance conditions, especially by coupling the OH and the NS stretching band, you see the reaction is speed up faster, almost three times or more than three times under own resonance condition compared to known cavity condition. Then we try to understand this very clearly you see the so-called in same uh, catalysis process using line weaver burke equation. line weaver burke equation is uh, plotting the initial rate, inverse of the initial rate versus inverse of uh, substrate concentration. So this is been uh, you know, studied in, this, in, the, in, 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 in undergraduate school that we have literally, uh, uh, there are two parameters normally one is called the turnover number, the second one is called catalytic efficiency. 
uh, you can calculate for Einstein using this kind of fitting methods. One of them is line mirror plot method, inverse of inverse plot. Here you can see that when you plot different concentrations of substrate versus uh, the, the rate, initial rate of the reaction, you get a straight line. Okay, so this condition one is if you have an inhibitor, if you have no inhibitor in the in the in the enzyme, if you moment you have an inhibitor, the slope increases. You can see the slope changes drastically, but your turnover number don't change. So this is called competitive inhibition, that has been taught in in enzyme cl biochemistry class course. So you have your uh, your turnover number don't change, your efficiency lose due to competitive inhibition. So instead of competitive inhibition, what we see actually a competitive catalysis process that I can show here. In a non-cavity condition, as you can see here, my turnover number is 0 0.06. This is 0 0.06 uh, roughly around in a strong coupling, but the catalytic efficiency is increased roughly seven times or more. So this is, you see that no change in the turnover number interpret a competitive catalysis by strong coupling I am basically uh, we are basically uh, catalyzing the process or activating the process faster uh, by field coupling this is what is happening in this particular experiment and we tried a same isotope experiment as you can see here so we try to took, we try to take d2o instead of water D2O non cavity experiment is done. As you can see here, D2O and non cavity as well as cavity, we see actually almost negligible change in the, in the line view of the plot, and the slopes are all coming similar way. And only one thing I noticed that we see that when you just change from water to D2O itself, the drop of the reaction is roughly around 1.3 times. Okay, so if this is still not primary kinetic acid of effect, this is a smaller than primary effect is 1.3 times here. But very important to take home message is here D2 coupling won't affect the reaction rate specifically by coupling D2 solvent molecule. So just solvent molecule coupling won't control the reaction. But here again, this proof the concept of cooperative DVSC of H2 controlling the reaction uh, chemical reaction. And this is the most important things that we are trying. This is actually like, like, a, uh, like a, uh, you know, uh, we don't understand why it is happening. We still don't understand why it's happening, but we see very similar trend happening in all the cases what we are, when we are doing coupling strength experiment. For example, here, this is 100% D2O, this zero mentioned, zero H2O molecule. This is, okay, this is in, in molar. You can see that, you know, this is 50 by 5.5 molar. This is pure water. As you can see here, just changing from here to here, you see the rate of the reaction slowly varying. This is the 1.3 change times change I was mentioning in non-cavity condition. But whereas coupling, uh, coupling strength increases, I see actually a non-linear change in the reaction. A very clear non-linear change in the reaction. So this clearly indicate that you no know, cooperative is playing a role, but we don't know what is the origin of this nonlinear behavior. Because many times when we submit the paper, reviewer asking us, why are you seeing a nonlinear effect? Because splitting energy goes as square of concentration. But I am seeing all the time nonlinear change. The same thing in the desalination experiment also, they have seen a nonlinear change. So somebody has to crack this conundrum to understand what exactly is happening. So we are understanding, maybe you have to understand transient state and how it's relation to, can, it's relation to the, the observed rate of the reaction. But what we did here for the first time, we, we used VSC as a tool to understand at least, uh, we proved again the Fourier mechanism, uh, the, the proton shuttling mechanism in this enzyme experiment. So we use it as also, also as a tool. So uh, that's it, I, I have, yeah. We have a Please. question in the chat from Rafael Rivero. Uh, so okay. yeah, what is roughly the uncertainty in the measure, measured reaction rate measurements in the V0 versus H2O plot? This one? Uh, I hope this one. Yeah, so you can see here, normally in, in non-cavity experiments, we don't see a big variation as you can see that only the problem the cavity experiments to get on resonance condition is a nightmare all the time because you have to have the cavity more efforts are exactly matching in all the experiments. So you see each of them are experiment. These experiment repeated four times. So this average of four. See that that's the reason that this variation comes. 
So I can say that the uncertainty, this is the variation from the standard uh, deviation from the, from the uh, what do you call, I would call it as um, uh, slope, standard deviation of slope, ISM, literally, residual of uh, slope. They vary accordingly because the issue here, main issue, and also you have to think that this is inverse of inverse plot. Normally they get more and more close to the zero. So this is how it is explained. Cavity, we have this problem. Uh, but you can see the overall trend is something like this, specifically. I hope that answers the question. The only trouble that we have to couple, we, we have to have our FSR exactly matching each time. This is actually the nightmare. So our experiments are all manual experiments. We don't do it, uh, you know, using any motor control or something. It's all manually done. Um, Professor, we have one more question in the Please. chat. Yeah. From Gerrit Lewenhoff, how often were the experiments on slide 28 repeated? Are the error bars smaller than the dots? Slide 28. This one, ah, okay. Yeah, uh, this experiment we have only done for concentration. So you can see this is 0% water, uh, 25 uh, and 50 and 75%. Only one time we did. So I don't have any long more information, uh, but uh, we are getting the very similar trend that of the previous one. Then we just uh, didn't do much experiment, at, you know. And the referee was also convinced. So, but we still don't know what is the origin of it. All right, shall I go ahead? Yeah. Okay, so here uh, I just brief so far what happened in this field. I mean, it's a very new field. I mean, it started in 2015. I would say that there are a lot of, uh, you know, uh, discussion going on, theoretical studies is going on along with few experimental studies. So still, we are not sure that which one is the right way, right path. Initially, when we are doing strong coupling, especially desalination reaction and the experiment with spiroferrin, we, we were thinking that the reaction gets slowed down only. But it's just not the case. You can see that direct coupling desalination reaction, the pre energy drop increase was roughly plus 3.67. And the activation change is also, you can see that the enthalpy of activation energy increases here for this particular desalination ex experiment. Another one, this cooperative experiment I just mentioned, here you see that we see a free energy drop. Whereas another group from Japan, they tried this experiment, the print cyclization, uh, Hirai and team. They found actually again uh, free energy increases, and very recently from Thomas Erickson Group again they try to do you know this uh, uh, cyclobutadiene derivative and it's it's uh, it's a thermal ring operating process which follows woodward hoffman rule. They found that you know it's also depend upon uh, coupling different uh, functional group. Carbonyl they couple they see that the the, the free energy drops goes negative, whereas um, uh, CH band coupling then use it speed up or free energy increases. So we still don't know exactly what is the cause of it. Maybe symmetry plays a role, which we have to understand. There we are now with respect to the current scenario of this work. So we have to do more experiment to clearly prove it uh, or some theoretical backup has to be there to explain this. So I conclude, uh, I conclude in such a way that, you know, there are a lot of studies on photocatalysis, okay? So I am trying to think to compare whether photocatalyst can be compared with cavity catalyst, but may not be because photocatalyst required external photon, photon will be consumed here. But here in cavity catalyst is virtual photon is created. Maybe there is no conception of photons. So I can call it as catalysis, but what we see in our thermodynamic data as you see that free energy is changing under such experiment. Hence, catalyst is only a representative term. IUPAC term suggests that the free energy should not change. For a, for a catalysis process. But we are seeing left and right free energy is moving. So we have no idea what is, whether it can be called as catalysis, but this is only a representative term. But it's sure that we modify chemical reaction. This is a purely unconventional way. We started with thinking about laser coupling and then all the way reach to this virtual photon coupling can control reactions. We can do band selective. We have already shown band selective coupling. Then maybe next target is somebody will be trying to do more selectivity. And all most important is that existence of the vacuum fluctuation is verified again by doing all these experiments. Um, Professor, we have a few questions. Um, yeah, please. So, uh, in
in the chat from Jeff Ogrodsky. He says, sorry for the bad feedback. I was going to follow up on Hoel's question. I also do not see how you can see tuning with angle out to 20 centimeter inverse, but the reaction modification peak for k equals zero. Could the mechanism involve how polaritons mediate interaction with the couple, the uncoupled reservoir or select a sub ensemble of an inhomogeneous reservoir? This is my colleague yeah. Igor Bograftman's perspective or my understanding of it. I also wonder if it could be modified pre-exponential factors, efforts related right, yeah. to selective coherent effects. I think Joel Great. is- Yeah, this, uh, I, okay. I was trying to understand like while you were talking about, yeah, when Joel was asking me about normal incidence and changing the angle. Now I understand how the importance of, yeah. So I also, I also don't know what it really does literally because experimentally I cannot uh, show it because Angle dependent experiment in reaction model, somebody have to do it. I mean, selectively, that's the only difficulty, experimental difficulty. And maybe if you can able to follow by dynamics, looking into the dynamics, maybe one of the option to see that. Definitely, it will be very interesting to see that like reservoir playing a role and you controlling the reservoir, like a cooling bath or a heating bath. It'll be a great idea to look into, but I have no idea as of now. Mm, and we have have, yeah. Please. One more question yeah. from Matt Du. Yeah. Hi, I have some questions about your experiments where you change the Ravi splitting uh, by changing the concentration and you, then you see the variation of the reaction rate. So okay. for the uh, enzyme experiment with the D2O and H2O, I was wondering, mm -hmm. like on slide 28, I was wondering why you didn't recover the uncoupled rate when you had 100% D2O, if D coupling to D2O doesn't really do anything. You mean uh, this? Like, this, at, yeah, concentration zero. This yeah, how come they're, yeah, the, those aren't the same? Like, why is there a yeah, right. noticeable difference? It, it should normally come back to the same value, but uh, yeah. I, I don't know, but this is only one set of experiments I'm saying that I'm only looking at the trend because I don't know how to be related because I cannot even relate what is the relation is. So what I did actually, we repeated the experiment from zero. There are five experiments we did. Try to see that whether concentration versus uh, rate can be plotted and see, but we see similar trend from the previous, then we stop there. So as of now, this variation can be an error. I have no idea because we have not repeated the experiment. Okay. And then for your previous uh, project, the one with the PNPA, when you did the concentration yeah. dependent experiment, yeah. uh, as you decrease the, the concentration, did you recover the uncoupled rate? All right, so there I didn't plot because it's normally gave us a straight line, but I plotted exponential. This is semi logarithmic plot, the other one, but it's a similar trend, very similar trend. I think I recovered, I have to check it. I okay. think I've recovered because there, uh, uh, the, uh, the good thing there is actually we just replaced what we was doing that we change ethyl acetate or we dilute ethyl acetate with anisole. It's a, just a solvent, uh, just straight away I change ethyl acetate with anisole, same polarity solvent. So what happened is at the end is actually instead of this, uh, this variation, I was just getting a straight line. It is in the supplementary information of that paper. It is okay. given, comparison is given there. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, please. Okay, so I was just concluding this way and uh, this is my last slide. Uh, I would like to thank all my, my motivated students uh, starting from uh, uh, Jabir, Jabir here, uh, Tabazum from the, from the right side, Tabazum, uh, Akila, Jodi, Pooja, uh, Kuljit, uh, Yashika and Parvati. All of them are uh, very active, very motivated students. And Jodi did these two experiments. And Juma is also in the team. So uh, they are motivated without their you know, hard work. I could not able to do anything. So this is quite a uh, uh, few of uh, funding agencies. Isom Ali supported us uh, uh, I mean, from the beginning, startups and so forth, and then Ministry of Education, SCRB, and STARS for funding. Thank you, our collaborator, Professor Thomas Abbasin, for, for introducing me this concept, and then I'm taking over some of this aspect that he's doing, and now we are focusing on cooperative interactions and 
and this uh, this area of research. I thank you. Thank you for your kind uh, uh, attention. Uh, I mean, your participation. So, if any questions, I can answer. Please, Sintana. Yeah. Um, so, do we have any questions? I have seen the chat box a lot of questions, or are they happy? I think the questions in the chat box I asked I'll ask the uh, already. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, yeah, I think we have uh, one more question from Matt. Hi, I have another question. Uh, so I'm just wondering the Ravi splittings that you have in your experiments are you know very large, right? Like on the order of like almost ten percent of the vibrational frequencies, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, exactly. But yeah. How, so. To me, it's strange that even when you detune your cavity mode just by you know tens of wave numbers, then you already observe a huge drop in the reactivity. Yes. Do you have any insight uh, on why this is? Just a minute, I'll go off to that particular slide. Uh, you're talking about this mostly, I hope. Or yeah, any yeah, any of the slides where you vary the. Yeah, I can tell about from from this one. I can tell straight away. Here you can see here. I mean, it's almost to follow the line shape of the of the molecule molecular band clearly. So uh, the splitting energy here is one hundred eighty wave numbers, and the splitting energy changes definitely because maybe you have to look into the whole field coefficient how this is collapsing because I only plotted the K apparent versus uh, wave number here. We clearly see that you can see the blue original spectrum and the dotted line here. It's almost indicate that a clear, you know, uh, almost look like a very similar line shape. So which may be telling something which I have to still look into. Uh, yeah. So uh, I would say that, you know, as like initial, I mean, the question from Professor uh, Jeff Ofrowski and uh, Hoyle were asking about this, uh, that if you, uh, if you take it in a higher angle of, so for example, higher uh, dispersion angles, maybe you are, you are playing the reservoir, this I have to see that. But here is all on uh, normal incidence, static cavities experiment, clearly it's following the line shape. So this is all I can say now, but I don't know uh, the other way. Like, I don't know how to do the experiment the other way. Okay, yeah. thank you. I think we have uh, one more question from Joel. Sorry, uh, I guess following up uh, with what Matt has asked. Yeah. So yeah. question, maybe you already showed data about this. So if you really are at resonance with the molecular line shape at K equals mm -hmm but your concentration is not uh, strong enough and then you're only in the weak coupling regime, do you see changes in the reaction? I guess you cannot see that in the cooperative experiments because the solvent really is very concentrated. Yes. Huh. Then you uh, I can, uh, I don't remember, you are talking about the previous experiment? I guess in any experiment where you could have just weak coupling and resonance. You're, you're, yeah, so I have not tried that. You were saying like you make very low concentration of, uh, or you decrease the coupling strength and look into that. How does it changes? That's yeah, what but, you're asking. But, but at resonance, uh, yes. Yeah, I understood. Yeah, I have not looked into. Yeah, but only thing that we we did this concentration experiment, as you can see, up. Um, yeah, this this concentration experiment that you see splitting energy changes with the so here y axis is semi log can see that we still follow the same nonlinear relation as you can see but we have still errors we can still say that you no know, uh, i was looking into basically whether i can fit into our inner plot but but i'm not sure but this is of course following this way this is all pure i mean it's this is pure but this is changing so you see that uh, this is pure ethyl acetate the ethyl acetate concentration is dropping here Okay. So uh, this is what is happening here in this case. So uh, Wait, here I don't remember exactly what percentage of the acid, but the splitting energy you can see this omega by two omega is basically increasing. Okay. So when when the omega goes almost to zero, do you have any results? Um, that I have not tried because um, yeah, 
Uh, yes, a good point. Yeah, I should try this because then I have to see that where it where the intercept comes. Okay, thank that's you. what. Yeah, I, I have not tried it. I I tried. Uh, I think some. I don't remember now. I don't know what concentration. Twenty five percentage, but I have to see the now. This omega is roughly point uh, zero two. Uh, yeah. So I have not tried that condition exactly. That. Yeah, I understand. To prove the reservoir effect, this may be useful. I will definitely think about this story. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so if we don't have any more questions, thank you, Professor Gino George, for a wonderful talk. Um, thank you. Before we end, I just want to make one quick announcement. Uh, can I share my screen? Yeah, definitely. Just a minute and let me just stop sharing it. Thank you. Yeah. So next week, we will have Professor Jonathan Foley from the University. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending, and see you next week. <laughs>